Jake, welcome to the show. Thank you for making time for this. Uh, I have a lot of heavy questions for you about theology and the search for meaning and all that kind of stuff, which I'm very excited about. But first of all, uh, you have a new album coming out very soon called Death Below, courtesy of our friends at Sharp Tone. What can you tell people about the album and what to expect for that before we get into the heavy questions? Absolutely, man. Well, first off, I'm uh, thankful to be here and, and be on the show. I appreciate you inviting me. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for our conversations. But I, I think for Death Below, the record coming out March 24th, um, you know, we, JB and Dustin, our guitarists and bassists, are our main songwriters. Um, and I think during, you know, this whole pandemic situation, um, they really just wrote how they felt. And I think in that time, like many others, um, we were kind of facing um, some some struggles, isolation, um, you know, uh, some fears and as a whole, I think our band was kind of going through a, just a, a challenging time. So a lot of the music on this record is, you know, gloomy, dark, um, kind of has some sorrow to it. Um, and it's very progressive. So it's, it's, it's definitely a record of its own with its own identity. Um, and I think that, uh, I think people will resonate with it because, I think that they themselves will connect with the feelings and emotions that the music and the lyrical content carries. And, uh, but it is unlike something we've done before. Um, and, and I, I find it to be very uh, unique and beautiful in its own way. So, uh, but I'm very proud of it. And I think it's uh, something very special. I've heard kind of similar things from a lot of bands about albums that they did during the pandemic. And I think maybe a lot of fans may not understand how stressful that is for you guys because, you know, nobody knew how long this was going to last or what was going to happen when things were to come back. And most bands, I mean, you guys do well, but it's not like you can just chill without making money for three years or something. And it's like the pandemic took your income away, most of your income away from you, took, you know, your lifestyle away from you. And you know, that was a much, a much more stressful situation for bands than I think a lot of people may realize. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely a challenge, uh, you know, going from touring four to six months out of the year to absolutely nothing. And I, I do believe that we tried to do the best with what we had. Uh, we had like a, a live stream. We were, you know, recording some songs in the studio trying to stay connected to our fans and stay active. Uh, there were some, you know, some bands didn't really um, have much there. And and so I think we tried to scrape together as much as we could. You know, it was, it was really unfortunate because we had just, <laughs> we were on tour when, you know, the whole world shut right. down and we were about to release our record guardians. And, you know, we were thinking, well, wh what should we do here? Like, should we not release the record? because now we're not going to be on the headliner promoting it, but we actually felt that it was important for our fans to have music in this time and something to be excited about when things felt very um, shaky. Um, but yeah, I think overall, you know, we made the best of what we could and we're just all very thankful. I think it was a good moment for artists Um and just for people in general to be thankful for what they have and realize that life is fragile, things can be taken. And it also might have inspired artists to dig a little deeper as being unique to themselves and creating something even more different or um, human than just going, oh, we're going to write a catchy you know, right. catch you song or, you know, whatnot. So yeah, it made a um, lot of people sort of ask fundamental questions about life that maybe they'd never really thought about before and, you know, feel like feel their own mortality in a way that a lot of people, you know, in their twenties and stuff. I mean, when I was in my twenties, I never thought about that, you know, but with COVID everyone's like, Oh shit. Like any of us could actually just die tomorrow. 
there was definitely that fear um um being being present and um i think isolation and having to be you know a lot of people were alone during that time i think that that does give you some time to self reflect and to think about your life and um and how fragile it is for sure and really quick before we go any further have you checked out my patreon patrons get early access to all my main channel videos and my podcasts i also do giveaways sometimes for example i just gave away a pair of these eargasm earplugs and if you want me to review your music there's a way to do that as well all you got to do is join at the ten dollar and up level then every month i do a call for submissions if you want me to review something all you got to do is drop it in the comments of that post then i will review it live on twitch and post it on patreon for everyone to see so if that sounds cool hit the link in the description of this video and i appreciate your support i'm not a christian myself but i've always liked christian bands because i felt like their lyrics were about things that were more me like i didn't ever really care about people just like fuck you dad i hate the cops blah 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 like to me that's always felt like kind of trivial whereas a lot of christian bands were asking much more kind of fundamental questions to me, which is like, what are we doing here? How are we supposed to live? And how do you know if you're doing the right thing? You know, just these sort of like very basic questions. And uh, I was watching some interviews uh, with you to get ready for this. And there was one thing that you said in some old interview that I thought was really interesting. You were talking about how you, before you became a Christian and joined the band and stuff, you were into alcohol and girls and you said it was because you wanted to feel love and that you used music as a more healthy way to find that. Can you tell me more about what you meant when you said that you wanted to feel love? Yeah. Um, so with my background, um, I was, I grew up, uh, kind of in a toxic family household. So my parents, um, both great people, and I love both of them, but, you know, they were in an unhealthy relationship. And so there was a lot of verbal abuse and manipulation. And um, growing up as a little little boy, um, a lot of times it was very scary in my house. And um, my stepfather, once my parents got a divorce, my stepfather was also manipulative and verbally abusive and i felt like to you um, or the whole family to me, or? yeah to, to me yeah. specifically um and so you know just kind of having this upbringing um where i didn't feel appreciated or i didn't feel like i was safe or i didn't feel um a lot of times i felt like i was um uh, like i was always walking around in eggshells and i couldn't I couldn't maybe be myself or um, I had to be very careful what I did or how I acted. And, um, you know, watching your parents kind of continuously arguing and lashing out at each other and perhaps saying really, really hurtful things about one another to you, mm -hmm. um, kind of feeling used. Um, you know, I kind of ran to alcohol because I was introduced to alcohol when I was when I was younger and I had a friend who was older than me. You know, I spent a lot of my life trying to find a father figure. Um, so I would go to older guys, you know, and older guys could be like two years older than me. You know, somebody right. who had some experience in the belt, maybe lived on their own or um, was a leader of some sort. And so when you're 14, a 16 year old seems so much older. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're in middle school and there's a high school kid there, you're like, Oh man, like he, he knows the way, you know? Yeah. Um, so I really struggled with understanding like self care, self worth, um, and what love even was, you know, like sometimes I would say to myself, like, even if love came to me at the front, my front doorstep, I, I, I don't even know if I would recognize it, you know? And so I tried to find that in finding a, a father figure and, and a lot of the guys that I met, I mean, you know, they, they, they worked really hard and they drank really hard, you know? And so, um, a way for me to kind of self-medicate and to numb myself, but also be able to feel 
like I could say whatever I wanted to say. I would drink and I would drink with these guys who I looked up to and and felt safe around and they weren't going to they weren't trying to manipulate me. They weren't going to scream and and yell at me or demean me. They were they were telling me their life story or things to look out for or you know watch out with this or work really hard for this and things like that. And so um you know that was a a big part of my teen years and then finding music um as far as like going to shows and that had a community of people that was felt like they were black sheep and felt like they were the underdogs and I could resonate with that community and that music. And so it really just gave me a safe place to be myself and kind of figure out who I am and who, what I needed um, and was kind of my home because my other home was very confusing and toxic and uh, divisive. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I mean, I feel like um, with where I came from, it was really hard for me to understand or comprehend what love looks like, how it acts and um, how to connect with it. The reason I ask that is because I feel like there's a lot of musicians who are looking for love, especially vocalists, who are looking for love through the validation of strangers, of fans, because they kind of fundamentally feel unloved and they don't love themselves. And they think that if there are hundreds or thousands of people telling them they're great, that that's going to fill that hole. And, uh, and, it, and it never does. It almost feels to me like, you know, that is a false God that a lot of people worship, if that makes sense, especially musicians. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree with you, um, a hundred percent that, you know, due to trauma or due to the lack of something, we're going to search for it. And, yeah. um, that makes sense to me as a human being if there's something that you're lacking you're gonna go try to find it and the reason why i became a front man was because when i went to my first hardcore show there was the um a band called strike anywhere and you know you're familiar they're just amazing punk rock hardcore band with um and and i saw them in this really small venue 200 cap uh, called New Brooklyn Tavern in, in South Carolina. And the singer, Long Dreads, just ripping on stage, uh, looked like a lion. And just, I I had never seen so much energy um, come out of some a human being. And he was preaching his gospel, right? He was preaching his truth and what he believed and the, what things he wanted to change in the world. And, you know, his words of encouragement. And, and I was so astonished just blown away by him and he steps off the stage and I run up to him and I'm, you know, 16 years old and, and I have a Sharpie in my hand. I got from the bar, you know, and I'm like, dude, I'm just so so blown away by you. Um, I don't really have anything to sign. Will you sign my arm? And he said, yeah, absolutely. So he signs my arm. He gives me the Sharpie back. I'm looking at his signature, looking at the Sharpie. And then I look back up at him and he's like, now you sign my arm. And that exchange that we had, because, you know, again, I'm looking for a leader. I'm looking for right. someone to to show me that I'm worthy, that I have purpose. And he showed me that, that, hey, I know you wanted my signature and you just saw what I did, but you're just as important. Mm-hmm. You have just as much purpose. You have just as much worth. And we are equal. And that's the moment that really I had an opportunity through that experience to find a purpose and to recognize that there is great power in the authority that this individual carries Mm -hmm. through being the front man of a band. And I said to myself, I want to do that. I want to, I want to be that guy, you know? And um, so that was really the, you know, the fire starter for me. Not only did it give me direction and, and it, and it gave me purpose, which is something that 
I so desperately needed at that point um, to know that I had a purpose and things like that. Um, but, you know, here we are on our 20 year anniversary tour for August Burns Red. And, um, you know, and I've, you know, been able to make an impact um, with the music industry and, and, and our fans and um, in what I believe a positive way you know so um i'm very thankful for that experience and that moment in my life because it literally changed the course in my journey i mean it's amazing how one interaction like that which was whatever 20 25 years ago can really change the course of somebody's life and you never know who you're talking to at any moment that might be having that moment with you absolutely um, and I try my best to recognize that and spend time with fans. I mean, in, in the beginning years, um, you know, I made a promise to myself that I was going to go to the merch table and, and talk to fans. And at first, you know, it was like maybe 10 people. And then it grew to, you know, me st standing at the merch table for like a couple hours after we played. Um, and then in 2011, um, I had... You know, I'm I'm, I'm uh, a faith man, and and I'm you know just very thankful for what um, God's given me in my life. And you know, I don't like to put my uh, my faith on people. I don't think yeah. that that's uh, respectful. But if but if people want to know about my life, I, I I can't deny my own truth. Um, and you shouldn't. I mean, why? It's such an important part of you. Why would you hide that? Right. Well, correct. Yeah. Um, so. You know, I'm I'm on tour with the Day to Remember. We played back to back shows in Chicago, sold it out, and um, and I was just at the hotel that we were staying at, and I was just like, God, thank you so much. Like this is amazing. This is unbelievable. But that this is my life, and I really would love to give back. Like, if you can show me or tell me what to do that I can give back in a more meaningful way than just being on stage and then, you know, having some conversations. And this vision um, came to me that night of creating an online community for essentially in the beginning for my fans to be able to share about their stories together. Because what I was realizing over the years of going to the merch table was I'd hear stories of, you know, hey, I'm, I'm sober from, you know, I'm clean of heroin for three months. I wake up every day you know, with my sober buddies and we listen to composure or I was sexually assaulted when I was a child and the song redemption has taught me to, you know, forgive and find healing for that. Things of like that really deep, personal, challenging experiences that my fans felt they could be comfortable to share with me. And I would go, you know, I would talk with them and then I would go to my trailer or, you know, or my van, excuse me, or my bus and they go home to the same situation. So this vision came. I was like, hey, we can connect and stay connected with these fans, with these stories, and let them know and understand that there's other people that have experienced similar things. And they can, you know, be encouraged and grow together. And maybe maybe somebody's like, hey, this really helped me, you know, get healing. Or this is my story. And just hearing someone else's story could benefit that individual. So I made this website, I made little cards. And so with the website on it, and so that when I would meet people at the merch table, I would say, here, here, take this card and go here. And then I would go to the website and, you know, try to interact and just yeah. build this community. And um, so it really led me to, you know, not only this band and, and being blessed to, you know, live a dream, but it, it grew into this other, this other thing. Is this heart um, support? It, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's my nonprofit heart support. Um, and so it's just, uh, it's just wild, you know, how, how things can progress and grow. And, um, you know, I never had the desire to start a nonprofit, but, but through the experiences and the journey that I went with this band, there was this new desire in me to to want to create something like that and to help um 
And so, you know, that's, that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you mentioned people sharing these stories with you about how your music or your words help them, uh, which I'm sure feels amazing. The flip side of that, which I have seen a lot of people in particular in Christian bands kind of fall into people who I think really did mean well, and I, and I don't think they're malicious, but you can tell that they got a little bit lost in the sauce and almost started to feel like they were saviors and act like that a little bit, um, which I totally understand. And again, a lot of these people are like 22 and nobody was like, if I heard that I saved someone's life when I was 22, I, I don't even know how I would handle that either. So I get it. But my question is like, how do you kind of stay humble and, um, have there ever been moments where you've caught yourself kind of getting a little bit lost in the sauce? Absolutely. Um, so there was a time in my life. Um, and I, I would say that probably the interview that you were referencing was probably the birth of my religiosity. Um, because I was so infatuated, um, with my faith and the Christian faith and um and i still am and um you know obviously i have many more years and experience under my belt but there was a time where i had become very religious and the the really hurtful thing is that i ended up hurting a lot of my family um and people around me and i was very judgmental towards myself um which thankfully i've had the opportunity to make amends with my family for but um I think that, you know, one of one of my friends says, hey, you know, like the enemy, evil, whatever it is, what do you think um, it would want you to be if it can make you be anything? And I was thinking, oh, a murderer, you know, and my friend says, no, a religious person, mm -hmm. because you are taking what you understand and comprehend of your faith. And sometimes instead of letting god be god you you, you feel like you god. have you want to be jesus right you you feel like yeah. you get you get all this understanding and then you're like oh now i can tell people or i can or i have the answers and it so i went to a seminary um for a bit and as i was reading this book it was called um debating calvinism and i've heard of this one you've heard of this book yeah. Oh, I, I I think so. I, I had a I had a friend who also went to seminary. I'm I'm pretty sure that he told me about. Well, go on. I'm pretty sure this is the book he told me about. Oh wow. Okay. Well, I was reading this book called Debating Calvinism, and it's I'm, I'm a it, pretty um, big fan for a non-Christian. I'm a pretty big fan of Christianity. So okay, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, so there's a uh, there's this book, and it's got a Calvinist and an Arminianist, and these are just two gentlemen that have just different viewpoints on doctrine. And, um, you know, they have two different sides of how, what they believe um, in their faith, but they started to bicker in the book. I'm, I'm reading this book and one of them calls the other one a dog or something. And um, completely not the essence of what I believe is the foundational grounds for Christian faith. But I get this vision in my head and it's of uh, a sandbox and two little children, right, um, building sand castles in the sandbox. And they're pointing at each other, arguing which sand castle is better than the other. And God says, do you see this? I said, yeah, you know, I see this. And he said, they're children. They have no understanding or comprehension of me. And they're building their own castles using the same sand and then the vision like kind of got further away from me and it was like galaxies right like stars and all this stuff and you know i had the the verbiage the, you know this is everything that they're missing mm -hmm. um please don't do this you know please don't put me in a box please don't don't try to have all the answers please don't restrain me and have a leash on me because of your comprehension or understanding of interpretation from what another person has said about me because 
I can't work there. Um, and so I, I, and, and I'm not bashing, um, seminary. I am giving you my personal experience through going to seminary and what I felt led to do based off of how I felt and the vision that I got. So I stopped. I, 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 um, chose not to continue my school. What was like the kind of fundamental issue, meaning that you felt like it was getting into that mode of like arguing about sandcastles? Yeah, I, I, I feel like, um, I, I feel like for me personally, it's important that spiritual connection that I have with God and, um, that that's really important for me personally. And if I consume myself with just the study of God and the understanding of what man has understood of God versus um, the experience of God, which is two very different things. um, Mm -hmm. I could just become a shell of what I think knowledge um, and so I want God to work in my life. I don't want to try to be God. And so that was kind of my personal uh, friction point at that time. And um, so, so yes, to answer your question, I, I apologize for getting a little, a little off there. No, no, there, not at all. There are moments where I think as any human, when being glorified um, and you see it all the time, especially with pastors, celebrity pastors, right? Yeah. Like, you see that too, um, where these pastors are like Jesus to their congregation. And the wild thing about that is that the moment that that human being who is a pastor makes a mistake, a lot of times the church will excommunicate them. They right. won't They won't try to surround that person with love and grace and understanding and try to solve the issue. They'll just cast them out. Um and so, obviously, that's not okay. But, you know, in those moments and in, in, in those times, you definitely try, if you want to be humble and you don't want to take advantage of that, you you do recognize it and try to face it and say, okay, hold on a second, you know. Um, because I, too, feel uncomfortable when someone says, you saved my life. I did not save anyone's life. Um, I might've been a vessel catalyst tool resource for you. Um, just as much as the singer from, you know, strike anywhere being a vessel tool resource for me to feel and make some sort of connection. Um, and I'm glad that I could be of service, but I, I am not saving anyone's life. Um, that's not my position. And as a, and, and as a Christian, I don't believe that that's my position. I be I believe my position is to love God and to love others. Um, and you know we can get into the, you know s- the sticks with all the little you know things and and what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And you know quite frankly, um, my understanding to some of those things is is I'm still growing. But what I do know. Meaning, what like, I if do, someone asks you about some the the getting in the weeds with some particular verse or that sort of thing, yeah, yeah, I because, yeah, yeah, I think that we're so we're so hungry to know that we're either right or that mm-hmm. that's the truth and there's nothing else. And what I'm learning in my life is that if we believe in you know, the Bible or we believe in life, it evolves, it's growing, it's constantly moving. And I'm not here to tell you you're wrong and I'm right. I'm, I I believe that there is a life and that we're all working on separate experiences and journeys. I do believe that there is a God. And the only reason why I believe that there is a God is because I believe that I'm having experiences with God and God's doing things in my life. And I have worked very hard to try to have a father in my life. And God was like, I'll be your, I'll be your dad. You know, like you're running to all of these men 
and they're they're all you know men they're humans yeah. you know but but if you you know come with me i will i will show you what a man's supposed to be and i will and you'll never be alone and so that offer for me sounded pretty great um that was that was a, a beautiful invitation for me and i find you know jesus's story to be a love story and my relationship with god to be a love story so you know i'm not out and and i think that that's why i might have turned from the seminary because i had a vision saying don't put me in a box <laughs> so i didn't want to learn all of these things and hold on to them and just be like nope that's the only way that this is going to fit and right. um i just i don't think that that's my job i think my job is to love people where they are and let God be God and try to be sensitive to um, loving people the way that God has loved me in my life. Um, and again, also give myself room to recognize that I am human and which that is a humbling place to be because there are times where I feel like I'm God and uh, you know, and, and, and that's, and, and I have to check myself at the door um, which I try to do you know, but, um, yeah. You, you mentioned the importance of men having a father figure, which I'm glad you did. I think that's like such an important message that I know there's going to be some people listening to this or not going to be happy with me saying this and you don't have to agree with it, but I feel like in the past, I don't know, probably 30 years or something like that. Like the, the idea of the nuclear family and in particular, the importance of men has been kind of under attack. And I know that that's not a popular thing to say, but like men need a father. And I understand, I mean, my parents got divorced. I don't know my birth father. Like I understand that sometimes families don't work out. I'm not judging anyone. I totally get it. But men go off the fucking rails if we don't have a father figure in our life, which like the person I call my dad is not actually my birth father, but he acted like it. And, uh, we just, we go off the fucking rails if we don't have a strong man in our lives. Yeah. I, so I understand that has become a political issue. Just it's not like, political to me. It's not. Right. It's just a, I, a fact of life. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was going to say. Like, I feel like um, just in general, society has politicized everything. Right. Yeah. But, but let's take, Let's just for for people who are listening, because obviously you and I are on similar pages. Let's put all of that aside and just look at life and humans and people and how we work. Um, you know, when my parents got divorced, um, my mom had no money, you know, and, and she was working two jobs trying to provide for myself and my sister. And we ended up living in lower income housing. Now, in lower income housing, there are a lot of moms that are moms yeah. and dads and have to provide and protect and nurture and um, help their children grow. And the shit that I saw there is really sad um, yeah. and really can mess you up. And um, shout out to and all the mom moms doing all of that, by the way, like this is not a criticism of them at all. Like I, have tremendous admiration for them and we should do everything we can to help them because that is an incredibly difficult situation. Unbelievable. The amount of stress uh, and anxiety that I saw my mom going through. Um, but, you know, I mean, I was selling toys on the street. Um, there were, you know, I was hanging out with gangbangers. I was selling jewelry at school, trident gum for 25 cents. Like um, a lot of these dudes, died early and young a yeah. lot of their you know dads were dying and or going to prison and um and it looked very dark and gloomy because there wasn't a lot of opportunity there um the schooling system wasn't very good the people that were there were hurting um and there wasn't anyone who was taking the charge saying hey we're going to do this. This is the plan. Mm -hmm. I need you to be this. I need you to do this. I'm going to shepherd you. I'm going to, I'm going to love you 
into the position that you're supposed to be. Yeah. And so we're all running around with their heads cut off. Now there were gangs that were like, oh, we'll gladly take you. You know, we'll give you direction. Oh yeah. Because we'll, we'll, that's we'll what you're looking you. for as a young man. You want direction. You need it. Even if you don't understand that young men desperately need and want direction. 100%. And um, yeah, it, 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 it's a real problem in my opinion um, because men with no direction are scary. Yes. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we can be very scary because we're, there's something in us that innately wants to, to fight be God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? To control, we, we to be, fight, to dominate things. Right. We want to create, we want to build, we want to, you know, um, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, not, not necessarily dominate, but, um, you know, we want to be in the front of doing right. something that is creating, um, whether that's creating and having, building your family one day or building your own business or, you know, whatever it might be. And if that doesn't have direction and there's a lack of that direction, I feel like we can fall into the unhealthy things. That's when you start um, a gang. Like I'm going to build something. I guess I'm going to build a gang if you don't have better yeah. direction. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, it, it's just wild. Um, I mean, I just think that the family unit is, is important and, you know, kudos to my mom for, for being able to really raise me the way that she did, because I feel like considering all the variables within the wild equation of how we lived our lives, I came out fairly good. Um, yeah. you know, she did a really good job and, um, but I do think that, you know, a father figure is important. And I believe that due to the lack of mine, um, I, you know, met God and, um, and look at Jesus as, as, you know, what a man should be, um, and what a man should look like. And so, you know, now I just for myself is the change that God has done in my life. I, I genuinely just want people to experience that. That that's why I, I share when people ask me about my faith is because like, I genuinely want people to be able to get out of the things that I got out of heal from the things that I found healing from have comfort in the moments when I've, when I'm, you know, sad and struggling. Um, have someone to cry out to that I believe is going to show up and help me navigate the stormy waters of this life. Um, that's, that's honestly what I want for other people. And I feel like it's a good thing. And I feel like, um, you know, for a man like me who didn't have a dad, it was, uh, it's God saved my life. And, and that's, that's a legitimate statement. So, um, that's what I want for people. Um, and I understand, I understand that what I experience is not what other people have experienced with faith. And I think that religiosity, not having the tender understanding of God's relationship in your life and being able to hold on to that in order to be a catalyst for love, for God's love, um, and just judgmenting people leads people away from God entirely. And right. they want nothing to being do a with Christian and being close to God are two different things, right? They, they absolutely can be. I, yeah, I, I think that you, um, well, I think that Christianity is about God, but I think that what we tend to do is we tend to take what we want from Right. This beautiful story and then use it. And instead of inviting God into our lives to let God work through us, we tend to go, oh, no, this is how it is. And this is the only way it is. And you've got to do this and you've got to do that. You can't do this. Right. And, and, you know, what ends up happening is no one gives a shit about you. The, the person you're, you're offending is going to go, dude, fuck you, bro. And walk off. <laughs> right, right? I'm out of here. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then you're never going to see that person again. And then that person 
five years down the road, someone's going to be like, yeah, God's, God's been so great in my life. And you know what they're going to go? They're going to go, Jesus, don't want anything to do with that dude. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Because of what the person, the experience that they had previously with another human being. And like, that's why it's very, very, like I, I, uh, you know, I got to be very careful how I speak. And in past years, I didn't do that because I didn't understand the severity of, of right. maybe what I was doing or saying. But I, I, I recognize that now that I need to be very careful how I speak. And I would rather try to do my best through my actions um, to show people the gospel um, versus just rattling off all of the cool stuff I know, because that doesn't right. really do anything for anyone. And now I feel like even like our communication is so damaged because we don't listen to one another. We don't try to understand one another. We feel like we are better than the other person and that we're not equal. That's what I'm seeing from society right now. And, um, and how are we supposed to grow together if, if that's, if we already have these walls? It's like this- everyone is operating in such bad faith where we just take the worst possible interpretation of anything that someone else says. You know, if they're like, oh, I like the color blue. And they're like, oh, so you hate red and green. Yeah. Like, oh, that's okay. That's what we're doing. Why are we doing that? <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 you know, like, okay. So for example, like I have a, a crew member who's a, just a, you know, staunch atheist dude. I love him to death. We have so much fun together. We connect. And I actually like sitting down with him and talking about some of these you know, what people would say, uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. Beca- because like all that's going to do is strengthen me. It's going to make me question, put, poke holes in my faith or my understanding. It's I'm going to gain experience through the conversation on how to communicate things. It might trigger some thoughts that maybe I need to reflect on. I'm going to learn about another person's perspective. I might hear about an experience you went through that I have never experienced, nor have I ever thought about. Like, why are we so against listening to one another? And if we can base that conversation on love and respect um, and compassion, we, we all win. We all win. And, you know, it, it bonds me with this uh, crew member because I'm like, I don't see eye to eye with him on a lot of things, but th- I may not condone his actions, but it doesn't mean I can't love him. Yeah. You know, like, like, and, and vice versa. He may not condone how I live my life, but that doesn't mean that he can't love me. And I think that that's what we're kind of missing. And I'm seeing all this division yeah. and I just, and it pains me because I'm literally trying to do the opposite. I'm trying to get people like hard support. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter who you're in love with. It doesn't matter um, what you believe in, what you've done or what's been done to you. And those came from my vision when I started it the first night. I said, well, what, what's the boundaries here? What's the basis? God said to me, doesn't matter the color of your skin, who you're in love with, what you believe in, what you've done or what's been done to you. Do you know why? I said, why? He's like, because I accepted you and I didn't care the color of your skin. I didn't care who you were in love with. I didn't care what you believed in. I didn't care what you did or what was done to you. And so, you know, that is what I'm trying to, my understanding of how to love and serve God and serve people, right? Um, and trying to create. And I just feel like I'm seeing the complete opposite from society. Yeah. And we're we're hurting. I think everyone is hurting to some degree. That's what it is. Um, and they're taking out their pain and misery and frustration with the world on other people. And that's only making it worse. And it's sad. And I don't know how to break that cycle. I'm only one person. I there's only like I I, I don't know what to do, but it sucks. Do you know my dad told me he goes, Hey man, because I had this I went through a really gnarly divorce in 2015 and, you know, I was drinking pretty hard and I was so angry at myself, also at God, 
Um, and I said to my dad, I go, what's the point, you know? Um, what's the point of doing all this, you know? And I went into some pretty heavy stuff with him, and I, I don't want to go into it here because I, I sure. really don't want the listeners to start questioning that in their own life. It's not, yep. I don't feel like it would be beneficial. Um, and he goes, look, you've got your little piece of the map and you just do what you can there, you know, and that's, that's you contributing. Um, we think that we have to be somebody at the top in order to make all this change. But if we were to all take it upon ourselves to make the change, the people at the top don't have the authority at all anyways. Right. Cause like, do you know what I mean? You can, yeah. somebody could say, this is the way it's going to be. But if all of you just, 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 there's a million of us and there's one of you, what are you going right. to do about it? Right. Like we are choosing to do this. So it's, it's a choice that we have and you know, it's a beautiful, it can be a beautiful opportunity to not only change your life that you have and your purpose and bring you more fulfillment and joy through acts of love, but um, it could change the entire, you know, course of where we go as a society. Um, I mean, look, when I was a kid growing up, listening to all these punk bands and stuff, I was a super hardcore atheist that, you know, looked down on any religious person and blah, 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 all that typical kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, I, I don't really know why, I guess, because maybe I heard some like Christian hardcore bands or something like that. I was like, well, I'm not going to just be this dogmatic guy that won't even give it a chance. So I made friends with some of those people and I went to church with them and I went to Bible study with them. I went to some Krishna temples. I've been to, you know, Catholic, you know, um, uh, Catholic <laughs> mass with my mother-in-law a million times and stuff. And I don't yeah. necessarily, it's not like I became Christian or Krishna or Catholic or whatever, but I'm really glad that I did that because I learned and grew so much from it. And I took so many really, really important like transformational ideas from that that helped me a lot. And maybe even more importantly, I used to, when I was a kid, I was honestly ignorant and judgmental and looked down on Christians and thought they were stupid. And, and from getting to know them, I, I realized that, you know, I was just being a judgmental asshole. And I, I'm not saying that I have it all figured out or anything like that by any means, because I'm sure I'm still a judgmental asshole many times, but, uh, I just would hope that anybody like, why would you want to go through life having any kind of like ignorant judgmental ideas that are based on just a fundamental misunderstanding of reality, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I, I just feel like, um, I feel the same way you do, uh, where I was judging the church and I, you know, I was in just like, I was so judgmental towards the church and I've been that way my whole life. Um, because and a lot of I Christians started, are, by the way, people may not know that, but there's a lot of Christians who don't like the church. That's a super common thing. Yeah. The, the um, in my opinion, I have traveled the world and I would go to churches everywhere and they were all doing it the same way. And I thought to myself, well, that's weird. Like we're supposed to be um, connecting with the Holy spirit and unique in you know, and they're all serving the same community or demographic. They're all structured the exact same way. And that just feels very organized, uh, business oriented versus yeah. like, Hey, this is how our church is because you know, this now I can go back and forth and I've, I'm not bashing churches because I have plenty of leaders in churches that I highly respect and, um, and love but I'm just giving my personal experience through my life. And that's what I can, that's the only thing I can give. But I realized that I was going through church and I'd be like, Oh my gosh, this is tacky. This is stupid. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And God was like, Hey, what are you doing? And who are you to judge? You know? Right. Like you're just a guy. They're just, yeah. They're broken people. Just like you, bro. Like, yeah, shut up. Shut, and, and they're here worshiping me. So what, what, are, what are you doing right now? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, maybe they look a little goofy or maybe that person, you don't understand them because that's uncomfortable for you. Right. But that's where they find peace and joy and love and, and me. So exactly. who are you? Who the fuck are you? And I was like, 
you're right. You know? And, um, I remember I was thinking about this in my house. I was running around crazy by myself and I was like, God, I need to, I need to apologize. I need to make amends to the church. How do I do that? I shit you not, dude. My friend Ben Sledge calls me. He's a pastor at a church. He calls me within seconds of me saying this. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, so I just pick up the phone. I'm like, Hey dude, I don't know why you call me, but I need to apologize for the way that I, and, and he know, he knew where I was coming from and my backstory. And, you know, I got to apologize to him at least um, for the, the way that I had perceived the church and judged them and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's just very interesting, but, but yeah, I feel like, a good start for us who want to pursue faith or don't is really taking time to understand us, who we are. Um, what, what do we believe is the point or purpose or life? What are we lacking? And where do we honestly believe we can find that? And maybe start there and go on this journey or if people want to encounter a relationship with god you know one of the things that i really like to do is uh, journal and i like to journal my thoughts and how i feel and then i like to ask myself questions from those things and i pray in the sense of i'm gonna i'm gonna just invite god into this into my 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 thoughts my body my spirit and my words and, and just see what happens and what comes of that and just try different things, you know? Um, but at the end of what I've seen thus far for myself is I see that we have a hurting world full of people yeah. that want to be loved and we are messy and broken, goofy, silly, and, quite many times misunderstood. And I believe that there is a God that has created these people. And I believe that God has a source of unconditional love. And the more that I can understand that, the better I can receive it and then give it. Because I believe whether you're a Christian or not, that's fine. I believe that we were created for two things. Um, th one is to give love and one is to receive it. And we can't do either of those alone. Um, so you said, well, look at these front men and, you know, they, they have thousands of people praising them. They want to be loved. They yeah. are receiving that love, right? What are they doing? They're, they're giving what they have and they're receiving. People on Instagram, they want all those followers. They yep. want to be loved. They, they feel like that's a good way of them getting love. You create your own business, right? You, you, you feel loved. You've given something. I opened a gym during the pandemic. I have my community there exercising and working on mental health classes and exercises. That to me is me giving love them flourishing and growing is my reward. That's them loving me back because I, it gives me purpose. It, it shows me that I am making an impact and they are growing from that and they are better in themselves. And that's what I believe my purpose is. I I'm going to give you one just brief story real quick. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I'll be quiet. So I built this gym with a bunch of people. I think that if we want to be successful, we need to have a body. Um, Your so, Life Gym is the name of it for anybody who's interested, by the way. Thank you. So so I, I need a body of people to help me. And that's exactly what happened. Pandemic, I wasn't working. The president of Arsenal Strength, which is a very, very high-end um, exercise equipment company, I went on tour with him. He was in a band called uh, The Showdown. He donated, him and his partners donated equipment to me for my gym. My realtor found me a beautiful gym space. Um, that gym space was actually connected to a church, which I thought was hilarious and um, kind of chuckled at. But now I have learned that the people at this church are actually really amazing, beautiful people. Um, and so creating this, this, Jim, one night I was closing it down and I was touching the equipment and I was just resonating with the thought and the idea that this was a dream and I am now touching my dream. And I started to cry and 
I was like, God, this is amazing. I can't believe that this happened. People's gyms are being closed down and, and, and you brought the most beautiful thing you that you have to offer me your, is people. You brought people to me to help. And we created this beautiful thing. I said, God, I really want to know my purpose. And I feel like I know it. I just can't articulate it with words. I'm driving my truck. And the verbiage that came to me was, for me, my purpose is to enrich the soil of community and their flourishment and growth is my reward. Um, and the reason why I love that is because I feel like I've never been able to express or explain that. Secondly, it's my dad telling me my purpose, not just some guy um, or you know some dude that I look up to. And it has nothing to do with fame, success, money. It's literally just this is your your unique gift and purpose. And and I want that for other people. I want other people to have and to know and to believe or to trust and have faith that they've got their own unique purpose and then to live that out. Um because I just I just don't want I don't want everybody to feel like they have they have to be the same like everyone else. Because I think that cheapens the authenticity and uniqueness and individuality of us as creation. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Well, I have one last two part question for you. Um, <laughs> I think that one of the kind of common themes that we have talked about in this, in this podcast is about like judgment and being judgmental and like how to, how to, um, how to overcome that in our lives because it's like such a negative force in the world. Um, for me personally, I get very frustrated by the fact that there are so many just, to be honest, like negative judgmental dickheads in the metal scene in particular. And, uh, and, and I, I don't want to be angry with them because I know that's not, the right way to respond. That's just like my animal instinct is I get so irritated with these people that I interact with them constantly. Just like, I fucking hate all you people, but I don't want to feel that way because I, it's, it's just, it's not going to help me. It's not going to make the world a better place. So my two questions are number one, um, if somebody out there might be like, Oh, I wonder if I'm one of those negative judgmental people in the metal scene what would your advice be for those people? And second part is what would, what is your advice for me to avoid getting angry and lashing out at those people? Because I know that's not the right way to respond. Sure. Yeah. Those are good questions. Um, well, first off, we're all judgmental, right? Uh, to some degree at some point. Um, and I think for someone who might be like, well, am I that type of person? I would, Say, yeah, simply, how do you, re how do you typically respond to people? How do you communicate to people? Do you shut them down? Do you listen to them? What kind of comments are you leaving on Instagram? Right? Like <laughs> what, you know, let's start there. Like, you know, yeah. um, I rarely leave. I don't know the last time I left a negative comment on, on Instagram because it's just not, my time is valuable and I would rather invest my time into positive things because I understand that. I'm going to either give or receive love through that. Um, but you know, that's where I would start is how do you, how are you communicating to people? And then the second question that they should ask themselves is how do they see themselves? Because, you know, mentally, if you have the perspective that you are a piece of shit or worthless or dirty right. or, you know, fucked up, well, chances are like your actions are going to follow and yep. that's because I just talked about this with someone else um, in another podcast um, that, you know, our perspective has a lot to do with how we live our lives, how we respond to people. If you if you if I were to hold on to my divorce and um, my ex-wife and, and what she did and what I did, I was not a good man to her, um, you know, what that was. Um, if I were to hold on to that, it would definitely shut doors for me in my life. And I wouldn't be willing to be close or intimate. I wouldn't be, I would be nasty. I would probably react 
with my feelings and emotions rather than taking time to understand something and responding. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say. There's two questions. The thing that, um, the thing that I try to keep in my mind for when people are rude to me or judgmental or nasty is that, and I'll use my divorce as another example. Like my ex-wife was not nice to me and, (laughs) and I had a lot of anger towards her and a lot of resentment. And then I feel like God kind of showed me a vision of her as a, as a a, a little girl with um, a torn, a torn dress and bruises and crying and, um, you know, stains on, on her, on her dress and tried to encourage me to understand that she was broken and hurting. Um, and so a lot of times when somebody is judgmental or they're nasty, there is something that is in them that they don't understand, or they have been hurt, um, or you've made them uncomfortable and they don't know how to respond to it. So they're going to respond in a, in a protective way, like a, like an animal would where, you know, you come too close to its food or you come, you come too close to its cub and it lashes out. It's protecting um, through aggression. It's the same thing. We protect ourselves through aggression. Like, no, dude, fuck you. It's like, Whoa, right. What just happened there? Right. Um, So trying to understand that like, man, that's a human. And I've had moments like that too. Um, What can I do to better the situation? Can I help this person? And if I can't, I need to walk away because I'm just going to make it worse. I'm not of any help at this moment. And so I'm going to disengage. Um, So that's what I would recommend now to be able to think of all of this in the moment (laughs) when you're getting heated, it's a completely different ballpark, but that's what I personally try to do to my abilities as uh, just being a human dude. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. I will let you go. Thanks again for making time for this. And uh, I am excited to see the album. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, man. This has been a really uh, interesting, intriguing conversation. I appreciate it.